Fake laugh. <laughs> yeah, not too bad, not too bad. All right. Cool. So, um, as I mentioned, being part of Shopify Partner means I get a Shopify representative to talk tonight. So Joyce is going to come up wherever she is. I've lost her. Here she is. She's going to let us know how to level up. Look at that, you're running. Going to let us know how to level up your Shopify store. So I'm going to hand it over to you.
but unlike visitors at bricks and mortar stores, your online customers don't actually get to see or touch the product that you're selling. So they're relying on your description of the product to actually buy it. So a clear and concise shipping and return policy actually gives your customers a feeling of security that what they're buying is actually guaranteed to be what's, what's represented. If you can't give that guarantee, your customers are probably not going to trust you and they're probably not going to buy from you. So a few best practices are to keep it simple and to the point, leave the legal jargon out, that's for your legal pages, include any product or lifetime guarantees if applicable, give your customers fair time to return, highlight any additional requirements or charges that might be applicable, give customers options, for example, returns past this date will get a store credit or X amount gets free returns. Make it clear what the expected condition is or like what's not legible for a return, for example, underwear or food. So a solid return policy actually helps you to increase sales because customers see it as a guarantee that you reflect the trust that you have in your product. So they will shop from you. Six, don't leave money on the table. And I'm talking about abandoned carts. So abandoned carts are a really common problem with e-commerce. The average abandoned cart in 2018 was 75%. That's three in four people that actually abandon your cart when they shop with you. They're also a really good source of recoverable income because your customer has actually moved from a really cold lead to a warm lead who has actually shown intent to purchase from you. So experiment with abandoned cart sequences like multi-channel, um, multi-sequence, subject lines, cart offers, on-site, off-site, it's definitely not possible to have like a 0% abandoned cart rate, but if you could just increase your abandoned cart rate by 10%, how much more money is that going to get you? Next, you have give them options. By options, I mean more payment options. Customers love options, and we have options to give them. Lots of secure payment gateways for your customers that you can actually help them to convert with. I think I have some merchants that actually make about 50% of their revenue just from afterpay orders. So that's something to definitely consider. Next, you have reduced friction with Shopify Pay. So more than 50% of shoppers actually don't make it past step one of checkout. Why is that? You've done all this amazing work to get all your customers to your store. They're about to check out. And when they, get to, when they get to check out, they bounce. So we killed the checkout, and we built Shopify Pay to reduce that friction to check out. Customers don't want to wait in line. They're shopping online because they don't want to be at a mall. They don't want to be queuing up behind tens of thousands of people just to buy the shirt they want. So with accelerated checkout, we've actually reduced a dozen steps to just three. Experiment with channels. Take a channel first approach. Be where your customers are and in the technology they're actually using. Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, Curate even. Simplify the interactions with your brand. Reduce buying complexity. Create new ways to engage with your customers. Shopify has these native sales channels integrations and they're free to integrate as well, so use them. Next, you have Shopify Academy. So the best thing you can do for yourself as a merchant is to actually keep learning. Keep learning from Shopify Academy, from Shopify into the Facebook group, ask questions. Shopify Academy was created, and it's free, it was created to help entrepreneurs like you navigate the e-commerce world. It's got all the tools, workshops, and courses, and communities that you could need to actually to be successful on Shopify. So use it. So I hope that like Mario, who gets superpowers from certain mushrooms, you've been able to get at least one mushroom today that will help you to supercharge your store. Thank you. Awesome. All right, so next, uh, who here has heard of Paintvine? Hands up. Yeah, you have. Good stuff. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what Paintvine is unless you already know what it is. I'm going to let Alex come on board. So Alex is a Shopify merchant who is going to tell us their story. Thanks, sir. So uh, every time I practice this presentation, I was actually out of breath by the end, so you'll have to excuse me if I'm a little short on breath. Uh, I'm Alex, uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Paintvine. Um, we host paint and sip events across bars uh, throughout New Zealand. Um, and today we've hosted about 10,000 painters across six cities and 12 locations. Um, we've got two full-time staff members 
and about 17 artists. Um, and we're fully bootstrapped with about $3,000 cash. So I had a short video on Leo's advice. We're going to skip it, and you guys can check it out after. Um, so who started Paintvine? So there's obviously myself, um, but we also have Denim and Ewan. So Denim looks after our market. talking to you today. Um, I'm basically going to talk to you guys about how we grew Paintfine from zero to $50,000 a month uh, in less than two years. So we're going to focus on two areas, which is building a solid foundation for success uh, and building a flywheel that feeds into itself. Now, building a solid foundation for success. So when we started Paintfine, it was really important for us to own the entire customer experience from the beginning of the purchasing process uh, right through to the event after, after event delivery. Um, and it was important to be able to measure it so that we could um, or actually measure the, the customer journey. And it was important to measure it um, basically so that we could continue to optimise and improve it along the way. So one of my favourite quotes is, you can't manage what you can't measure. Uh, and what this means is basically existing tools for our business model were like, typically siloed and disconnected. Um, they move customers between payment methods and apps, um, and there was not really that great ability to be able to measure or optimise the experience for our customers during the buying journey. So this is kind of an example of a, a typical siloed customer journey. Uh, customer visits a website, they're then redirected to another payment method, um, issued a ticket from another ticketing system, and then sent an NPS post-event. Now the issue with this is that it lacks customization. Um, it's difficult to scale. And there's a lot of points of friction, so it's really difficult to kind of connect the experience together. So why do we use Shopify? Um, primarily to avoid silos. So it enabled our growth through um, flexibility. Uh, it also gave us fully customizable uh, website and apps, um, and the app ecosystem is seamless, so we're able to plug into it. Um, ultimately, it gives us a smooth and friction-free experience for both us and our customers. Now, this is the connected customer experience with Shopify. Um, so, our customers visit our website, they browse and purchase products using Shopify Pay. Uh, they get event tickets issued through Shopify and event reminders, um, and also post event get NPS surveys and, ref and customer referrals offers through Shopify. So, this, this solution is frictionless, scales, um, and also enables us to measure the experience across the entire buying journey. So what we've learned is that reducing friction opens up opportunities for optimization and scale. And we think this is the key to building a solid foundation. So now that we've covered how to build solid foundations, we're going to talk about how you can scale your business through building a flywheel that feeds into itself. So probably a good place to start, what is a flywheel? So a flywheel is a revolving wheel in a machine that is used to increase the machine's momentum. So think of your business as the machine, and the flywheel is a key component to growing. And why is it important for your e-commerce business? So with the flywheel, you can use the momentum of your happy customers to drive referrals and repeat sales. Basically, keep your business spinning. And there's three key parts that influence the speed and momentum of your flywheel. How fast you spin it, how much friction there is, and also how big it is. So what does Painfine's flywheel look like? So our flywheel has our customers at its core. We start with hosting amazing events that our customers love. This feeds into growing evangelism through our brand and business, and this happens through social shares and referrals, and also feeds into our digital marketing and awareness. We amplify the evangelism through remarketing and conversion optimization, and ultimately, we sell more tickets to our events. Now this gives us more money to reinvest into hosting amazing events that our customers love. As our flywheel spins faster and grows bigger, we're able to reinvest all this back into the business at any stage of the flywheel. So hosting amazing events. This one starts with a great product. Humans love to tell people about great products or experiences that they have, and we know that if we can deliver great products or great experiences, people are going to tell their friends about us. We also invest a lot of our money into artist training, 
high quality materials and equipment. Um, and we always ensure that we're always wowing our customers. After our events, our customers talk about us online. Uh, and naturally, they become evangelists for our product. We measure and leverage this, um, evangelism through sending post-event surveys. Um, and after the event, we, well, after the positive experience, we get them to leave us a review on Facebook or Google. And this helps further proof the social proof aspect of buying. <coughs> Next, we leverage and amplify uh, this evangelism through the influence of the discovery process, which is awareness and digital advertising. So as our organic reach grows, uh, we attract new customers and we remarket to them and our audience continues to expand. Uh, we also run regional based discovery ads um, and we do this on platforms that our customers typically hang out on. Um, this captures them at the perfect time uh, and the engagement and social tagging further amplifies our impression share. So once they're on our site, uh, we capture emails and customer details through pop-up boxes. Uh, we also use apps like FOMO to drive authentic fear of missing out. Um, and we also use our stop counter app which helps count down tickets to our events. Um, and this also sort of amplifies our customers' intent when they're on our site. Finally, this all leads to the final step, which is selling more tickets. And this helps us make more money, which we can invest into hosting amazing events. And so, the flywheel grows faster and bigger. Now, I wanted to put this back to you guys. How's this going to work for your e-commerce business? Well, a good place to start is asking yourself, what does your flywheel look like? And perhaps starting with, is it broken? Or, where is it broken? And do you have solid foundations for your business? And are you leveraging the right tools to be able to reduce friction? And do you know what tools are out there and how they work? So why is it important you answer these questions? Because a solid foundation plus a fast-spinning flywheel equals a great customer experience. And a great customer experience is the key to any e-commerce business. Thank you. Awesome. Excellent. So next, um, for those of you who are in the Shopify NZ Facebook group, there's been a lot of talk about, hey, how do I make Shopify work with zero? I've tried some of these apps. Nothing's really working. Um, and one of the answers that started coming through was this business here. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to actually have Jack here and tell us, how does Reconcile work? Thank you, sir. So hey everyone, I'm Jack. I'm to have a quick chat about an app that me and Andy here have built and kind of use it as an example of how apps that increase productivity and automation can be just as important as an app that's used to increase your sales or revenue. So the app we built is Reconcile. What Reconcile is, it's a Shopify to zero reconciliation tool. And I'll start by telling the story of how we discovered this problem and how Reconcile came about. So I had a couple of friends who were in a paint, uh, sorry, a couple of friends who were in a Shopify store and paint that. sales data inside of zero. The core problem, which I a lot of you familiar with, is the total payout does not match the total sale amount. Existing solutions they tried were exporting every single order to zero, and even when they did this, it still didn't match against the payout. And as the business scaled, this has become unsustainable, and it just overwhelmed the general ledger. And to manually make adjustments to each order for each payout, this is not realistic you're going to deal with hundreds of orders every day. So they had three options. They could just mark all the payouts against their sales account. It'll be fast, but they're going to under and over-report their GST, under-report their sales, and under-report their expenses. They could spend hours each week manually creating invoice in Zero, which contains all of the payout data. Or option three, as said, the other friend build an automated solution. So not wanting to incorrectly report their GST amounts, they had to spend hours each week manually adding this data into zero. After getting tired of doing that, they picked up the phone and called me. And I quickly put the focus up together, which instantly saved them hours of time each week. And not long after that, Andy and I realized that other people probably have this problem as well, so we decided to rebuild the app so that the Shopify store owners could take advantage of it. And that's how Reconcile was born. So now I'll quickly walk through how Reconcile actually works and how it can save you money as well as the obvious time. So here's an example store. They've sold a thousand dollars of product, let's just say t-shirts, 
Shopify's taken their 20, $25 fee for using their gateway and you're left with $975 in your payout. So if you just reconcile that payout against your normal sales account, you're telling Zero that you only sold $975 of the product, you're going to underreport your sales by $25, underreport your um, expenses by the same $25. And because that $25 has a GST component to it, you're not going to claim that back either. And to expand on that, let's say the same store has also sold another thousand dollars of t-shirts to someone in Australia or any of the GST free product. So the same comes again, they take their fee, you're left with 1950. So again, if you just map that 1950 to your sales account, you're telling Zero to calculate GST on the whole 1950, which works out at about $250. But the actual GST effect is about $130. So you're going to overpay it by about $120 here. Now I'm sure you can imagine, as the store sales volume grows, and they sell into multiple countries and different sales taxes in different regions, these inaccuracies can become quite significant. So reconciling you solve this problem by consolidating all these orders in, that are part of that payout into one invoice that are reconciled against your uh, Shopify payout. To do this, we allow you to select which of your zero accounts each income and expense types are mapped to. So for instance, sales that didn't have GST like those t-shirts coming back to an account in zero which has a tax rate of 0%. Then with that, with that, we'll process the payout and generate an invoice that looks like this. That's a bit small, but it's right. Um, so each income and expense stream is summarized and placed into one line item. This means that the net amount will total the actual payout in the bank feed, allowing for one-click reconciliation, knowing if it's a comfort or not, all your accounts are so adjusted correctly. And that means something your account is being very pleased about. This works for all things such as refunds, adjustments to the orders, and even stores that have multiple currencies. The second way you're saving money now is due to low accounting costs. As Zero already has accurate reconciled data in it, meaning there's less work for your account to do at the end of the year. Um, so where are we now? We have recently just been approved and listened to the Shopify marketplace. Um, about three hours ago we got approved into the Zero marketplace. Uh, this kind of notes don't make sense anymore. Um, but in the gift bag that I think Leo sends out at the end, there's a link which will double the trial period for you. So if you are interested, make sure you use that. Um, so that's pretty much reconciling in a nutshell. I've kept it as brief as possible because it's accounting and accounting just boring. <laughs> so I'm going to hang around for a while afterwards and ask you again if you've got any questions. Um, for those of you that don't know, to get your app into the Shopify App Store is a huge hurdle. So, uh, well done for you guys to get Shopify to approve that, because uh, we've done a few. So, well done for that, and well done for getting into the uh, Zero ecosystem as well. Um, so, to take away from that, if you don't like doing accounts and you want everything to be matching, use Reconcile. <laughs> All right, so I don't really want to uh, do an introduction for this person. I kind of want this person to uh, do his own introduction. And uh, we're going to have some fun and do a bit of a Q&A. Just me and you. Just, just you. Oh, you can sit. Do you want to sit? I think we'll sit. Go, go. Which one are you taking? See, this is awkward now. So you have some fun. Here's your mic. Thank you. It's always awkward having to introduce yourself. Yeah, well, that's why I did it. Because mm. I didn't want to do it. It's a real New Zealand thing that we're really uncomfortable talking about ourselves and selling ourselves, eh? I think so. So why don't you tell us, in case we don't know who you are, and um, how, how did you end up on TV and all that stuff? Yeah, great question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... Um, where to start? I, uh, out straight out of uni, I, I finished um, uni, I studied sports science, I then had no idea what to do with my life. I went over to Western Australia and worked in a mining village and managed a gym over there for a couple of years and found myself. Um, <laughs> it was very like uh, a very isolating job and I sort of I kind of discovered that I wanted to um, do my own thing and meaning like work wise I wanted to um, work for myself doing something that I cared about that was more meaningful than just working for someone else um, and making money for them. Especially in the mining industry, which is you know not something that um, you know, I wasn't proud of uh, working in the mining industry, and um, so I came back to New Zealand um, to start working in business, start a business called Clean Paleo with some friends of mine. And at the time, it was something that I was really interested in, and I still am interested in, um, just uh, 
health and food in particular. So we um, made health foods, and we do still do make health foods. Uh, so that was about six years ago. Um, so I came back, started working on that. It was just like a little bit of a hobby job, it was, but it was still, yeah. It was, I mean, it was a job, but it kind of felt like a hobby because it was just fun, and we just kick around all day and shoot hoops and basketball. <laughs> because at the time, you know, we were still building, and um, we, you know, didn't have that many sales. Start, that's what grew, grew and yeah. yeah so it was great I did that for a couple of, I did it for maybe a year and a half before I then went on um, the bachelor TV show and I um, the, the story of getting on the show was I just um, basically I just got asked out of the blue I was with a modeling talent agency back when I was at uni and um, to try and earn some money over my uni holidays and so I was still on this this talent agency books um, and they called me one day um, out of the blue because I hadn't heard for them for a couple of years and, and said, hey, would you be interested in um, auditioning for this uh, TV show? And, um, can't even tell you what it's about, but like, or what it's called, but we can tell you what it's about. And, um, and I kind of read between the lines and I thought, I think this might be Bachelor. Um, and it's a show that I'd never actually, i uh, never watched myself. Um, and uh, it was just such a, it was, uh, uh, such a unique opportunity that kind of presented itself, and I've always been one to just take advantage of every opportunity that's kind of been thrown my way, and so I, uh, I did, and I went into it very naively, and I, I went in with the hope, like, at, at that time in my life, I was working uh, with Clint Kalea, we were out in East Tamaki, and um, it was just me and my two buddies working, we had no other workmates, and we didn't meet any people out there, and so I wasn't really in an environment socially where I was meeting people, so I, I was, um, apart from like you know, going out uh, on the weekends and going to bars and stuff and meeting people, and that was just like, um, I found out pretty quickly that was not really my cup of tea. Um, number one, I just like hate trying to talk to people when the music's really loud. Um, it just really grinds my gears. Um, so <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so then I yeah, um, I went into the, I decided I, I was going to do the show and I. Um, Went in with like hoping, really, truly hoping to meet someone. Um, deep down, I probably, I probably actually didn't. I wasn't sure that I would. I, I saw it just more of a as a really incredible experience. Um, but what I, you know, am just so, I'm so grateful that I decided to have the balls because it took a lot of guts to do that, um, to do that, to to go on the show because it's been such a life changing thing for me. I've met um, my wife. My now wife Matilda on the show, and um, we got married earlier this year, and we're about to have a, a child in September. So, um, so it's been a hugely incredible experience for me, but it's also something that I kind of now it's like four years gone, and I, I kind of Matilda and I forget that we're even on the show, um, which is really interesting. But um, yeah, that's kind of how I got that to there. That. That's how you got that. That's how I got on the show. Yeah. So now you're on the show. The show's finished and suddenly you come out of it like overnight are you suddenly like a massive social influencer like what happens after the show yeah really interesting so um it was like that i um before going on the show i had it um i'll talk about instagram because that's the, the social media form that i really use the most and um, everything it's um overnight i had a, I had just a private social media page private instagram page and just would post whatever i want whenever i wanted to my friends didn't care what I um, posted because I just was able to just be funny, be myself, um, and then overnight I gained like twenty thousand followers on the first night. Would that be nice? And then, um, which is really interesting because um, I think we were really lucky, Matilda and I, and everyone in our season because we've been on that TV show when just as social media was starting to go on the rise. So we went on that show, and I had no idea what a social media influencer was. And so. Um, and I knew that all the women on the show, they weren't doing it for social media because social media wasn't really a thing then. Whereas now, and in subsequent, subsequent uh, shows and uh, bachelors, but also other reality shows, I, I think a lot of people go on the shows because of social media and because they want that social media profile. So um, yeah, so that, that's kind of how it happened for me. I um, gained a huge following overnight and it was a very hard, tra yeah, hard transition for me going from having a private page where I post whatever I want so then just being uh, public property, essentially, and having to be very careful about what I posted. Uh, having to be very um, 
yeah, just what I said. It, um, what I think was pretty. I, in fact, yeah, I did one thing where I went to university in Otago, and we were all about having a lot of fun. And we did so many dress-up parties, and I love a good dress-up party. And we went to um, a guy, uh, Colin Thora Jeffries, who is a, a really lovely guy. He's a he was on a TV show years ago here in New Zealand, and I think he's on, on subsequent shows. But he's a he's a socialite in New Zealand. Um, and uh, I mean, it's like about a month after the show aired, we got invited to his 40th birthday party. And I'd never met this guy before. And, uh, getting invited to his 40th birthday party, and I was just like, that was so weird. Anyway, it was a Bollywood themed, um, he's, he's of Indian descent, and it was a uh, Bollywood themed party. So I'm just still in this um, Otago University, let's dress up, let's go all out headspace. And I dressed up in full. Um, traditional Indian costume, which I looked really good. Um, I had a beard at the time, and I decided it would be a good idea to wear five layers of fake tan. So, um, uh, yeah. I see where this is going. Yeah, yeah. and so, and I had um, a lot, like, no, I, I wouldn't do that now. But at the time, I, I learned very quickly, um, you know, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And I, I found myself becoming a role model. It was not something that I... Um, was like, hey, I want to be a role model. It's just like that was a thing that started happening, and I realized that I did need to own it because I had a responsibility to be the best person that I can be, and I wanted to be to um, to try and help other people. Um, yeah. I do, I do want to touch on a little bit about how the media follows you, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, because we're talking about Instagram just just before, do you do you call yourself a social influencer now? Are you one? Yeah, it's a title that I, I still don't feel, feel very comfortable with. Um, I yeah, and I don't really know why. I can't quite put my finger on exactly why I feel uncomfortable with it. I don't I, something I'm not really proud to say. If someone asked me what I do, I'd never say I'm a, a social media influencer, and I still I think deep down don't re that doesn't resonate with me. Do you, do you actually do it though? I do. Yeah, I do. absolutely. So uh, most of my income I make on social media. Just making sure. Yeah. <laughs> most of my income. Yeah, I, I totally make. Uh, if, actually, all my money comes off social media in, in some form, whether it's directly or as a result of having a social media following. Um, and it's, I mean, it's fantastic. It means it frees me up to put a lot of time. I mean, played up as, um, you know, as yet I haven't really, I haven't paid, we haven't paid ourselves, but social media means that we're able to support ourselves while we grow this business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Um, what are some tips that you can give business owners of how they should approach someone like you if they want to work with you as a social influencer? Um, like, you know, do, do you, char you say, hey, I'm going to charge you per post, or I need to take a cut of every sale that's made from the post I make? Like, do you have some sort of agreement? Or? Yep, yep, no, we definitely yeah, have agreements. Um, we, we have an agent that makes that a lot easier for us. Um, I don't know many people that like talking about negotiating money when they're concerned, and so I'm one of those people I don't like talking about money. Um, so it's great to have someone to do that for me. <laughs> but in terms of being a um, at being an influencer and also having a company that wants to use influencers, it's quite I'm in quite a unique position where I can see I've seen and experienced both sides of it. And so um, I think the really important thing to to think about being a business owner is you essentially you don't. It's, it's going to work far better for you if you don't look at an influencer and see the amount of followers that they have and think, hey, I'm going to use this person to be a billboard for my company um, to help push it as a, a, in a traditional media form. The way, to, the way to approach it is to see this person um, and find an influencer that really embodies your values personally and also the values of your company, your brand, um, and that you perhaps want to you'd like them to be a spokesperson for whatever you're trying to sell. And so they're able to just do that naturally um, for you. So it's more about finding finding an influencer that really is a mini ambassador for your company, um, rather than just finding someone with a lot of followers who might push something out. Because authenticity is huge, um, and I think that that, yeah, it, it makes a big difference. Cool. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, and so and, and then in terms of influences, like you, I mean, I, we still, I mean, you, you've got to, you've, it'd be nice, to, you know, you've got to pay them, um, <laughs> you know, and we still, I mean, there's still, we, uh, we use a company called Colab. They're here tonight. They handle our social for us with Plate Up, even though you know, uh, um, 
pretty, I'm pretty, uh, pretty good with social media, but um, I still, I don't, it, um, it takes up too much of my time. So Collab really helps me a lot with that, and they reach out to influencers for us, and they are able to get some influencers on board for Contra, um, which <coughs> works really well, um, and then other ones that we pay for, but generally now you do have to pay for influencers. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay, so you've been on the you come out of it, fame, bit of a social influencer, um, then what happened next? I think you, you, you really... Then what happened? Was it right? Uh, Riot Foods, was it played up? Where did yeah. you go from there? Yeah, yeah. So then, yeah, we had, uh, had Clean Paleo um, and Clean Paleo, me being on the show, boosted Clean Paleo um, quite a lot. We, um, that definitely helped our growth, that business. We then, Riot Foods was in a, a company that we made to sit above Clean Paleo, so it's like a parent company, so that we could have other, um, the plan was, and potentially still is, to have Riot Foods as a, an umbrella company to have a lot of um, other um, health food companies that sit under it that are um, trying to do a positive, positive in the world. So um, that's how Riot Foods kind of came about. Yeah. Um, so then... Uh, and I was going to say, do you notice like uh, like sales will just burn every time the media will talk about you in the Herald and stuff? What they said. Well, let's say the positive stuff first. Like yeah, no, most of it's... Um, yeah, um, I... I think so. Yeah, I think so. I can't. I can't. I couldn't tell you um, for certain yeah. one way or another. But I'm overall, it's been hugely positive um, for the business. Yeah, hugely. It's good. Yeah. Um, and then, and then that leads into my next question, which we we'll have to go a little bit darker here, mm-hmm. um, because you know they got the spotlight on you. There's now these other articles that start coming out. I think late last year. Yeah. The moment. And. Um, I've got one of the titles here. Can I read the title out of what the, uh, the Herald did? It's a good clickbait title. Yeah, that's wonderful. Okay, uh, so on the 25th of Feb 2019, <laughs> NZ Herald publishes an article titled The Bachelor Art Greens Right Food Owes Six Million as Administrators Look uh, for Buyers. Did you owe no. somebody six million? No. No. Okay. No, so that's, well, yeah, so that's just one of our, um, our largest shareholders. There's also a, a, a lender technically, so you can basically just, yeah. that means it. Yeah, when you when you, <laughs> when you click into yeah, it, it actually it, explains it, that. It. But yeah, no, we we went through um, some really bad luck last year. We got our, our manufacturing one of our manufacturing facilities got destroyed by um, a routine cleaning operation that went wrong, um, and then insurance payout has been very very slow. Mm, yeah. It crippled our company company, and um, we went into administration about two months ago, which was still in um, and working through it, trading our way out. Yeah. Which is um, challenging, but um, well, that's, that's the same as we all, we all go through these challenges. Yeah. I guess what keeps you motivated to wake up and go and keep pushing forward? Absolutely, yep. Oh, was, my question was, what is what is what <laughs> keeps you? Right, it wasn't rhetorical. <laughs> um, <laughs> what um, I guess <laughs> just passion for what I'm doing um, and a, a drive to want to succeed. Um, so for me, I'm passionate about health food. Yeah. Um, and. <clears throat> Even simple things like just looking back and seeing how far we've come, or things like paleo, we, it's a very niche, uh, at the time when we started, very niche products. Our cereals are paleo, which is a, a niche um, diet, really, um, which we then helped to make far more mainstream. We, helped, like, we were the first ones to get into mainstream supermarkets, which is huge mm. um, for any, any company in New Zealand to get into supermarkets. It's a huge feat. Um, so just looking back on where we've come and looking at the little small and big wins that we've already had are just motivating. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And you mentioned before you're really sort of um, doing some stuff, collabs, doing some stuff for you. How, you know, wh- wh- how time poor are you? You know, what are you doing to keep you know, other people to help you or assist you? Yeah, so they are assisting you. Yeah, so, um, and to give a bit of background on that, my other, uh, I started a company with my wife Matilda a year and a half ago called Plate Up. <coughs> it's this t-shirt. <laughs> Plate Up. Co. Plate Up. And, um, <laughs> Great website too. Oh yeah, I think some guys might I can't you know, yeah. might start with a Z. Um, so we uh, started making healthy, ready-made meals, and uh, we launched with Bang, um, leveraging our social media profiles. Pretty much, that was all we, we did. We we made a really good product. We spent a lot of money on branding, um, which we have an eye for, and some good marketing. But essentially, it all came down to social media. Um, we launched with Bang. Our first month was like a, our, our first month was January last year, and then from there, and we, 
awesome. And then we slowly just started going down and down and down. We were at, we were at the stage we were on WooCommerce, um, and Zyga helped us switch over to Shopify, which was um, a huge... The life cycle, it starts off with Google, MMA Gym, Auckland, MMA Gym, that's what they do and they start comparing um, the, the top three gyms that show up. What we had to do after that is we had to start getting content that we knew Finn the Friendly Fighter was actually looking for after they've sort of discovered three or four gyms in their, in their area. So what we did is we did a beginner's guide on what to expect on your first day or your first month of training. Right? This answered a lot of questions, they start getting comfortable, they understand they're not going to be fed to the wolves and just be beaten up for two hours a day. Um, and so this was important for them. They also need to learn what type of gear they should come in, but it also helped us start pushing what kind of gear they should buy um, from the website. Oh, that's smart. Yes, I know. Um, okay, and then there's also YouTube videos about, hey, how to lose some weight while you're doing MMA, maybe by you're also eating some plateup.co.nz food, right? Um, so all of that was put into a package where the friend, uh, Finn the Friendly Fighter would see as they start going through the website. Okay, consideration stage. So now Finn the Friendly Fighter is starting to get a bit smarter. He understands uh, these MMA gyms, and now he's comparing them by price. He might be comparing products. Um, so all that information again is there. Don't leave our website, look, check this out. We do this, we do this. The other gyms don't do this. This is why you want to come to us. And behind the scenes, there's a lot of other emails going out. There's some you know, uh, free membership for a limited time um, or free gi if they want to do jiu-jitsu, which saves them about $200. Let's get them in the door. And so the next thing is the decision. So they either come in um, through the website, sorry, and buy the product or the membership or they actually drive to the gym and actually you know, sign up and go from there. So this is again the importance of persona and having that right type of content to push in front of them at the right time. Cool, simple? Yeah, we're all doing personas tonight? Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so if there's that one little gold nugget that you can take home tonight, hopefully this is it. If you're not sure what type of content uh, you need to write, actually hands up, who knows about this? Okay, good, so everyone else here is gonna learn something. Um, so if you're not sure what kind of content you should write, go to Answer the Public, I think it's answerthepublic.com, put in your keywords, um, you can select regions as well, you can select demographic, and what it does is it spits out what people on Bing, Google, Yahoo are typing with your key phrases in. So I'll just show you, it looks something like this. So we did MMA training, and I did it for Auckland. Um, for those that can't read, there's a whole lot of questions that people are asking. So um, how hard is MMA training? See, then the friendly fighter might have been looking at that. Um, how do I get started with MMA? How many times do I have to go to class, etc., etc. So all these give us ideas of the content that we need to write. I'll show you one that's a bit more popular. So I did Yeezy Shoes. Um, I did this globally. Everyone's got Yeezy Shoes, right? Um, and so one here, I know you can't read this. It says, how to clean my white Yeezy Shoes. Okay, interesting. Uh, what to wear with my Yeezy Shoes. So if I had a store selling Yeezy Shoes, I'd be now writing articles um, about this. Knowing that these people are really committed, they're really bought, so I know they're going to buy again sometime soon, and hopefully they'll come to my store because I have provided such valuable content for them through their journey. Right, so answer the public. That's your homework. I can see people are writing that down. Good. All right, tracking. So we've done all this hard work. Uh, we understood our personas. We wrote out all this valuable content. Is it working? So again, Google Analytics is your friend and something that you should be doing is setting up your page value. So page value pretty much is uh, someone makes a purchase, it looks at how many pages they went through and divides that amount into those pages. So you start seeing what pages are really valuable. So if you're writing really good content, you can filter that in analytics and have a look and say, yep, this is working or no. No one cares, no one reads that article or people read that article but they don't buy, what can I do? Um, so that is a great tool to use is page value. Cool. Um, so yeah. 
our clients, as, as, as we've been talking about tonight, um, they do use personas. We sit down with them and put a strategy in place. Of course, we do a lot more than just that, uh, but it is important to get those personas and content um, delivered at the right time to the right people. Okay, um, so that was pretty much it. That was quick, right? That was good, yeah, no, it was fantastic. Uh, so if you are interested in knowing more about us, uh, there's only, we're only about a team of 15, so we can't help everybody, we love to. Uh, but it's really important if you want to sit down and get a coffee with us so we can see if we're the right team for you and you're the right team for us and we can partner up and start working together. Okay, so hopefully you've gone like this tonight, or maybe you weren't, maybe you weren't nervous at all. And tonight, after hearing all the guest speakers and myself, you'll feel a bit more, uh, a bit more of a, I guess, have a swagger in your walk and you'll kind of look like this. Yeah, I've got some laughs, all right. Um, perfect. So again, we're back to slido.com. Start putting in your questions and um, I'll ask for all the guest speakers to come back up to the front and we'll do a Q&A session. Um, so I'm Talia and I'm in strategic partnerships at Shopify and because I have the mic I'm going to hold it for a moment um, and talk a little bit about our customer support team. So. As probably most of you are aware, at Shopify we have 24 7 support. Uh, but what you may not know is that we actually have a support team in New Zealand, which is really exciting. So we launched that late last year. Uh, so if you are contacting support by phone or chat or email uh, in normal working hours, then you may uh, find that you get a Kiwi on the other end of the line, which is pretty cool. Uh, and the team is growing, so we're actually hiring for a number of roles at the moment for our support team. So if you're interested, come and talk to me or Joyce or there's a few Shopify places. Actually, can you put your hands up, Shopify folks? Cool, so feel free to talk to any of them about the roles. Um, I, I'll say as well, they're all remote, so um, have a chat to us if you want to know about remote working as well. Um, cool, okay. We will jump into Q&A, so we've got the Slido link up there, um, and you can upvote questions as well. We've got lots of really good questions coming through. Okay, first question is for Art. What was the biggest change you saw moving from WooCommerce to Shopify, both positive and negative? Uh, we actually had a similar question, someone looking to move from Magento, so I guess your thoughts on migrating to Shopify. Um, I'm uh, I'm not very good with technology and websites, um, so you know my reasons for it, it being a good move are probably not that technical. Um, I like the way that it looks um, a lot better <laughs> than than WooCommerce, and I found it easier to use for being a, a real a novice. Uh, I also found that it was a lot easier. Well, I mean, I say I found, but. Um, Simon Glass Alvin found um, some really helpful apps that I view that we use on the um, website for our subscription and things like this. So I think just the apps that are available have been a huge, uh, huge step up from working with WooCommerce. Um, yeah. Can you share any of those apps that you're bold, using? Bold app's my um, favourite. And what's Bold? Bold is a reoccurring uh, revenue uh, app. So that's what we use for our subscription uh, product on our website. So it's something that is great because it's uh, easy to read. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's something that I recommend everyone to uh, try and build a subscription model into their uh, e commerce platform. And uh, yeah, Bold, Bold works pretty well for us. And it's, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know what WooCommerce offers as well, so um, you know, it could also be just as easy to do it over there, but um, I don't know, I found some files awesome for that. Great, okay. Um, Jack, does Reconcile work for reconciling bulk payments from Afterpay and Lindy, et cetera? Uh, so what we've done, we've started with the, the normal five payments gateway, and then on the side, we're doing it individually still, as we add these various ones in, because there's a lot of them. So they're all at least going to use own now, and then over the next and then they add onto the third, probably not the first, and then working down through there. So they don't do it in the same fashion, but it does still do it as everyone else would do it. Uh, so I think then there's, there's quite a few to add, but then there's, add, there's the most popular ones first and then work down. But it 
just, it does do them. Yeah, it's going to be, you know, after pay and label I first, and then pay afterwards. Yeah. Great, okay. Another question for Art. How do you decide what, what brands to partner with? Yeah, great question. That's something that I've um, had to, like, actually make an effort to think about um, quite consciously. Um, and I discovered this quite early on, um, you know, probably about three, three years ago. Um, so I only uh, work with companies and people and brands that I actually like and, um, and who make things that I would want to promote if I wasn't going to pay for them anyway. Probably, you know, getting paid for it. Um, so for me, that's uh, that's a big thing, and I learned, um, you know, I, I at the start was um, coming like, hey, I have 500 bucks to post about such and such, and I'm like, oh, shit, that's that's real exciting, that's cool, um, and it was uh, kind of remember like you know, something that I actually didn't really care about, and I felt quite um, didn't didn't leave me feeling very good. Um, just in, yeah, didn't align with my values, and um, and that's kind of when I realised that I was, uh, as, yeah, as lame as it sounds, I was an influencer that could, you know, could influence other people, and you know, I was like, well, actually, I, I might actually want to think about what I'm influencing people on and make sure that it actually means something to me. So yeah, that's it. I, I mean, I'm a rambler. Sorry. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Thank you. Okay, Leo. How do I figure out my buyer persona? Is that something that Zyla helps with? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so do we help with that? Yes, we would like to do a bit more than just uh, your buyer persona, so we want to work out all the content strategy and where, how you're delivering it, where are you delivering it on what platforms. Um, but yeah, if you picked up anything from that, um, hopefully you did. Um, but yeah, just start, we'll start with one. That's probably the main thing. I've had, I've got a client at the moment, she wants to do 15 with me. I'm like, no, let's start with maybe one to three, and then those be your main personas, and then you can break them down even further. Um, so yeah, look, these slides, I'm gonna be setting them out um, probably Friday afternoon, and so hopefully all the information's there for you. Great, uh, so there's a couple of questions around uh, increasing um, someone has asked how do you double your conversion rate, it seems too good to be true. Mm -hmm. Someone had a question for you, Joyce, about increasing conversion rates. Well, look, so as a marketing thing, I've done the whole let's double your conversion. And I get people coming, well, I want it to be triple. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, is it too good to be true? And look, it's, it's a relationship that we go together. Um, we, we do the work, we see what's happening, we look at all the data, you know, we've got our expertise, we've got our tools. Um, I was mentioning this to somebody before. It's like a boyfriend girlfriend kind of relationship. Sometimes we'll, we'll have amazing months. You just like sales up 120%. Next month not so great, and so then you're like, oh, what's going on? Why is this not working? It's like, oh, we gotta try something new. It's you know maybe people are sick of seeing these ads. Let's change them up. Um, but that's what we strive for. We strive for every month, you know, just gaining and gaining and growing. Um, but it's not always about sales. Sometimes we help to cut costs. Um, we had a client who cost per acquisition was $186 to sell a $200 product. That's not good. We got that down to 80 bucks. They still didn't think that was any good. So, you know, it's like, hey, we do more than just always um, helping you grow your sales. What was the second part? Uh, I guess it's just tips around. Jules? Um, 
Ross, you probably want to put your hand up. So Ross is one of our data analysis guys. Today he's doing a um, Google Analytics free 15 minutes. He's, he came up to me and goes, man, I want to get everyone's Google Analytics and then I want to call them and talk to them for 15 minutes to tell them what's wrong with their store. So there's a we tip right there. We actually have a question. There's a tip. I've seen exactly that. Well, there you go. Yeah, we with my Google Analytics. That's your man. So remember that face. <laughs> After this, go see him. Go, go, go there. So go there. Go oh, sorry. Yeah, we've got an iPad. You can put your details in. And then Ross knows that he'll be contacting me. Um, Art with quite an unusual question that's been uploaded multiple times. <laughs> really like your name, what's the story behind this, Art Green? <laughs> it's really not that exciting. Um, Art's short for Arthur, and Green is my last name. So <laughs> really, it's just my name. Um, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I, I, was, I was Arthur all my life, and um, then I decided when I went to uni that Arthur was a bit of an old man's name. I started calling myself Art, and uh, now that's my name. <laughs> so, yeah. Great solution. Um, okay, Reconcile, can we upload invoices used on credit card and can reconcile with zero transaction? I'm not sure what you mean. Who <laughs> 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 Maybe talk to me afterwards, so that was the information. Okay. Yeah, ask me after. <laughs> um, question for Joyce. What is the best app to link MailChimp to Shopify? Does it cut abandonment work with ShopSync? So maybe ask, answer the first part first. What's the best app? Mm. The best app is the best app that works for you and your store. It's very hard to say like what what's the number one best app in the world that's going to work with you because you could have like a different structure or a different type of business. So. Um, find what works for you. We have a few. We have ShopSync, we have Automate.io, we have Zapier. Um, yeah, find what works for you and what works for your flow. And is that a question? Is this yeah. um, I'm going to say yes, it does. Um, basically, it's basically an app that integrates between Shopify and MailChimp. So as long as the integration works, like it will pass the data through. So it's literally just a bridge for you to pass the data through. So yeah, it does. Do you want to start? Shopify Academy. <laughs> uh, I 
see that. Shopify Academy is great. Google is great. Before I started working at Shopify, I was just Googling everything because Google answers everything. Um, Shopify Academy is really good though. Um, it really gives you um, really in-depth lessons and courses around like big topics like acquisition, conversion, retention. You get to learn from the most successful Shopify merchants. Um, they tell you about the failures, the wins. Um, there's a community as well. You can leverage the Shopify NZ. Um, I have my own resources that I read as well, like blogs and stuff. Like Conversion Excel is one that I actually read a lot. Um, but yeah, Shopify Academy probably is the most organized um, course you can probably take. So here's some persona research. I'm gonna do it right now for myself. Um, hands up if you are looking to like partner with an agency that doesn't do the work for you, but you know, can sit down with you and consult and tell you what you need to do, um, probably like on a weekly basis. Hands up if you'd be interested in that. <laughs> that is also very true, very true. So let's say, you know, a lot less than what a traditional agency would charge you if they did everything for you. So this is, you still have power, you still have control, um, but it's, hey, this is what you should do, we recommend this, this is your homework, then you meet up next week, you go over that data, you review that. So. Yeah, I don't know price yet, I'm just asking the question out there. So let's just say if it was really affordable for you, would that be something that you guys would want? Hands up. Awesome. Hands up if you want somebody else to do it, like upgrade and you don't want to do it yourself. Hands up if you just, no. There's a few, okay, good to know. Yeah, the power of buy persona. Okay. For, for either of you. We probably built about three or four stores before we decided on our final product. I think the best way is just like playing around with it and figuring out what works. Um, with the trial, you obviously get 30 days to give it a go for free. Um, and we just found like playing around with it, messing about, finding what works and what apps like plug in really well was effective for us. Um, but yeah, I think the Shopify Academy also helps. Like if you have specific questions or um, really niche things about specific products that plug into Shopify, then that's definitely a good place to go. Yep. Cool, I'm going to add a couple to those. Uh, the Shopify blog, if you can set aside like an hour of your week to go through the latest articles, they truly are amazing. Um, I will add that our support team is great and they're not just there for technical support, they're there for business uh, advice as well. So definitely feel, to, feel free to leverage them as a resource um, and have one more. Uh, Zyphe, Zyphe. Thank you. <laughs> Took the words out of my mouth. Um, what was the other one? Uh, it'll come back to me. Um, well, you're thinking, I, with, with Alchemy, I, um, I found it really useful just talking about the businesses and finding out what they've done and um, learning from their mistakes, learning from things that work well for them and just asking lots of questions for similar businesses and similar phases and found that hugely useful. Um, and we, and so that's also one of the reasons why we put together this case study with Glass Elephant is because they, like, we've just kind of laid out what we've done with Plate Up. And, you know, we've only been going for a year and a half, but we've made, like, so many mistakes and so many things um, that people can learn from. So I just wanted to share that with people so that there may be some bits and pieces in there that are actually useful. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a really useful resource. It's all free. It's basically like the blueprint of how we do what we've done. Um, and yeah, so that's really useful. And if, if you do want to see that, it's on my Instagram. In my bio, link on my Instagram. Thanks. Uh, Leo, what was the site we could use to search for hashtags? Um, uh, the public. Joyce, is that right? Yeah. Uh, Joyce loves. Um, okay, another one for art. Could you talk a bit more about how you grew Play Up from the odd sale to now presume the orders? Yeah, um, the huge part has been that um, subscription that we built with that bold app. Um, and yeah, um, also getting regular um, EDMs going out. Um, regular content going out through social media and uh, quality of our product, um, maintaining the good quality of our product, and it's just been a slow build. Um, but 
but definitely, yeah, the subscription side of things has been really huge and something that's allowed us to keep our own growing. Um, yeah, and, yeah. Alex, it would be great to hear from you as well. How have you guys scaled up? Is there uh, other gaps as well? A lot of it has like just come down to like consistency. Like some of the things that uh, start off going really well at the start might slow up um, and slow down. But I think if you stay consistent with your message and your brand, and you're like really sort of uh, stuck on what you want to or who you want to target, um, the consistency starts to show through, and you start seeing the, the sales come through. And obviously, more people start recognizing your brand and the sort of presence you have. So. I think more than anything, it's like staying consistent with your message and, and not being um, content with like constantly changing and moving and stuff like that. I've got another great question here for you. Uh, what's the difference between ooh, a flywheel that is broken and a flywheel that needs more momentum? I think probably friction. So one that lacks momentum has a lot of friction between the parts. So you're investing all the time into maybe it's the digital awareness or the evangelism side of things and not getting the same return in sales. Um, one that's broken is there's basically a huge amount of investment at one stage and it's just not moving. So that would be like spending two and a half, three thousand dollars on AdWords and not getting a single sale. Um, there's obviously A, something wrong with the message, um, or B, the product is just not there. Are there a few uh, questions around uh, multi-currency and currency conversion? So I'm going to ask you to answer these, Joyce. Um, is multi-currency coming to non-Shopify Plus? Uh, are there any good currency conversion apps you recommend? Um, additionally, apps that offer checkout and the customer's desired currency. A few questions there that maybe you can just talk about the topic in general. Um, is multi-currency coming to Shopify payments for non-Plus merchants? That was TBC. Yeah, I don't know what it looks like.